true paranormal stories? That's what these authors claim. These supposed true stories are from a different internet. We are talking 2001, when a lot of us, me included, weren't even born yet. So I'm more inclined to believe that some of these could be true, as opposed to most of the stories that we hear these days. But I'm going to let you decide for yourself if you think these stories are true or not. I like to be open-minded to this stuff, even though I don't really believe in the paranormal. But with that out of the way, please enjoy, and if you do, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Sun Sees Dead Guys by Dan B. This started about five years ago when my husband and I bought our first home. It was built in 1898. When we moved in, my son was three years old and not too much of a talker. About two to three months after we moved in, my son was having problems sleeping. We assumed that it was a move and accommodated him. Weeks go by, and he still can't sleep in his room because there were dead guys. Well, we had started to get firm and say, there are no dead guys. You just miss your old room. One day he tells me that the one guy swears a lot, but the other guy is okay. Another time, I'm tucking him in, and he tells me that the okay guy is standing in the doorway. Why couldn't I see him? Yes, the hairs on my arm raise, but I dismiss this and change my tactic with my son. If there are ghosts, they haven't hurt you or us, and if they were going to, they would have by now. It has been two months since we moved in, and it is Christmas Eve, and we are driving to the home of some friends. My son is in the back seat, and he brings up the subject of the dead guys again, and I am again saying that if the dead guys haven't hurt us by now, so then he says, well, actually, they've passed over. Okay, maybe that may not be strange to some, but the phrase passed over comes from my three-year-old, who never strayed from watching Barney or Kailu and certainly never had a discussion with us about the difference between dead, dying, or passing over, no one had died during his existence, which needed explaining. I moved him into another room. Spring comes, and I am outside at the clothes line, and my neighbor is at hers. Wanting to talk to her about the old barn at the back of our property, I said to her, has anyone said anything to you about? I only get that far, and she jumps in and says, about your house? How can I resist? Okay, I said, what about the house? She proceeds to tell me that there have been two people who have died in this house. Number one. The old farmer who had built the house died of a heart attack in his bedroom, the one my son was in. Number two. There was a man who had committed suicide in the basement. Then she goes on to tell me that anyone who has lived in this house has been spooked by ghosts. So badly that one man had a heart attack, had to leave in an ambulance, and never came back. Now comes summer, August, and it is the hottest day, and I'm outside. I can smell fire. Hot fire. Like something is burning, but I cannot see smoke. This goes on for days, but I cannot see the fire. My friend comes over, and we are outside talking, and even she smells it. Finally, my friend and I are sitting in my kitchen having a coffee, and the cupboard door shuts by itself. Now lots of things have gone on for three more years. I still smell smoke outside, and I've had two more children. My second son, at age two, tells me there is a guy in his room, yes, the same room my first son had. Then another night, my husband is putting my third son to bed, and the one-year-old points to the wall and says, Guy, guy. So now I've had enough. There have been way too many things going on in this house to ignore. Through searching and searching, I located one of the girls who was raised here. Her father is the one who built this house and died in the bedroom. She and her sister came over to our house, and I was telling her about everything that had been happening. I always brought up the smell of smoke in August. She just looks, then she looks at her sister and says that they had a massive fire, someone had said it, in their two barns in August of 1930. She suggests that maybe since we had disturbed the earth where they had been, the smell had come up from the earth. We cannot confirm the suicide death, and the children have had no more sightings of him, the swearer, but I do know that old man Annette is here. He must be an okay guy. I have come to accept him as family, as he seems to almost sit with the children in their rooms. The daughter had said that he adored children and was a very kind man. The daughters come by often, and they feel at home as we would like it, but every time they leave, they feel like their father is at the door. Psychic Son by WJB2882. My son was two and a half the first time he amazed me. 
My son was in bed sleeping. It was about midnight. My husband received a phone call and told me he had to go. I went out the door with him and walked him to the car. He told me that his grandfather had been found in a graveyard behind the bushes. I went back inside and about an hour later, my son got up to use the bathroom. He asked where daddy was and I told him he had to go somewhere, but he'll be back soon. He said, because grandpa died. I just looked at him with a weird expression of disbelief and said, what? He then told me that grandpa was in the bushes and he died. I was shocked, to say the least. I said that was true, but he needed to get back in bed. My son has been telling me weird things here and there ever since. The only other thing that seems strange to me is that when he gets sick, he hears voices. The first time that happened was when he was seven years old. We were home alone and he was lying on the couch, sleeping. All of a sudden, he opened his eyes and asked me to tell them to be quiet because he couldn't sleep. I asked him who. He said, the voices are so loud in my head. Please tell them to be quiet. I can't sleep. I told him it would be okay, just to ignore them. He's never had mental problems, although to most people, it would sound like it. He's a perfectly happy, healthy 15-year-old now. He can still tell me things sometimes before they happen, and he still hears voices when he's sick. I Wasn't Me by Ben N. I was living in Arlington, Texas, in 1996, just south of DFW Airport, in an apartment complex. Across my hallway was an older couple that very seldom said hello to me. On Saturday morning around 7 a.m., someone was knocking on my door very hard. So I opened the door, and it was my neighbor asking for help. She said she thought her husband had a heart attack. I went over to their apartment and saw her husband sitting on a chair, but there was no movement. I lifted him up and laid him down on the carpet to give him CPR. The moment I got closer to his mouth to give him CPR, I felt something rush into my body, but I didn't think of it at that moment and went on with my CPR. A few minutes later, the fire department showed up and took over the action, and I watched. Even though I was feeling weird watching the lifeless body get shocked over and over, I felt that my body was getting shocked as well. The ambulance took the man to the hospital, and later that evening I found out that he had passed away. I went on with my chores for the whole day, just being upset that I couldn't save his life, but not too upset. Around 11 p.m., which is the time I go to bed, I started brushing my teeth in the restroom when I looked at myself in the mirror and didn't see myself. I saw a much older man. At the time, I was 35 years old and a very athletic person with green or blue eyes, but I saw nothing except dark black eyes with many wrinkles around my eyes. I did look like a 75-year-old man. The man who died earlier was 80 years old. I panicked, washed my face repeatedly, and then took a shower without looking into a mirror. But when I dried myself, I saw many wrinkles around my waist and noticed my falling chest. Just the day before, I was at a health club pool, and a couple of ladies mentioned that they wished their husbands would join the club and build their chest like mine. Anyhow, I asked myself, what am I seeing in the mirror? I was seeing that old man who died earlier that day. I couldn't sleep, and I went to Denny's restaurant around 2 a.m. One of my friends, who worked there, didn't recognize me at all. She took my order and went on with her other customer. She brought my coffee and started talking to me regarding how slow the night is, and she asked where I came from. I was more shocked that even my friend, who has known me for at least three years, we see each other at least twice a week, couldn't recognize me. I didn't mention anything to her, but she said I sound like one of her dear friends, even with the same accent. I didn't mention anything. I was afraid she would feel different about me if I told her the truth that night. I did tell her the truth a few days later, and she was totally shocked. She asked me tons of questions that I couldn't believe she was asking. I stayed at Denny's till 5.15 a.m. when the first light of day showed up. I went home and hit the bed without looking into the mirror. When later on I got up, I didn't look into the mirror at all till late that night, but I still saw the same person in me. I was getting very worried because I did look like a 75-year-old man. It was not until the fourth night that I looked in the mirror and saw the real me, and I was very happy. A month later, when the wife of a deceased man came home, I asked her when they buried him, and she said three days after his death. Window to Ancient Egypt by Connie P. During the Gulf War, 
I was very concerned about things escalating, especially because at the time, two of our sons-in-law were in the military. One day, after listening to the news and hearing how important it was that Israel not retaliate, I became very upset and got into serious prayer about that. As soon as I finished praying, I opened the Bible, and my eyes fell on Esther 4 verse 14. That was shocking in itself, for it was exactly what I was praying about. After some tears, I stood up and returned my Bible to the shelf, across the room from where I had been sitting. I put it down, turned, and took about three or four steps, when all of a sudden there in front of me was a large square-shaped area, and inside of it, almost like a movie, there was this beautifully formed, masculine figure of a being walking across this window, or whatever. He was walking across the desert sand. How beautiful was he? His skin was the color of copper. He looked exactly as though the great sphinx had suddenly come to life wearing a loin skirt. He stood about six feet, five inches, or more tall. I was also able to see the pyramids in the background. I stood there with tears in my eyes, my mouth wide in shock, just staring in amazement. Oh yes, he was carrying a small black box in one hand. As he walked, he suddenly stopped, turned, and looked right up at me. He saw me too. He appeared to be as shocked as I was. Then he turned back on his way, nearly in a run. Who could blame him? We were both in our own natural settings when suddenly our worlds and our times came together. What I saw was beautiful. He, however, saw this red-eyed, crazy-looking white woman from the 20th century. I think he screamed. Although I did not hear him, his face made it appear so. I later wished I had taken a step into that other reality. Who knows? I wish I knew who he was. I also wish I knew about the black box. I have had another experience with a black box. The Boys Who Live Forever by Timistral. My entire family comes from Brittany, part of France. And though I was born in the U.S., I lived in Campere, Brittany, for a few years and went to college in Brest, Brittany. I have lots of family in that part of the world, and I speak, read, and write French as well as English. While living in Campere, the third largest city in Brittany, I had a friend named Joel, an exceptional person who, though not well-educated, seemed to know everything. Joel was a native of Campere, but he was also an orphan. A fairly well-to-do lady had taken him and his brother in as foundlings. Both Joel and his brother Patrick were violent, reckless, and dangerous young men. They had been in jail many times for disregarding the law. If, say, they wanted a car, they stole it. If they wanted to climb up to the top of a 500-foot cathedral spire and tie on their shirts to show they'd been there, they did it despite the Campair municipal authorities. If they wanted to go to Ireland for a few days, they commandeered a boat and sailed over. Not a small task considering the coasts of both Ireland and Brittany. Both were excellent sailors, athletes, etc. In fact, what made them so scary was that there seemed to be nothing they were incapable of doing. I remember others immediately dropping out of athletic contests when Patrick and Joel were involved, and not in jail. And speaking of jail, Joel broke out of the gendarmerie jail in Campere four times because he knew the way out. In Brittany, buildings like cathedrals, city halls, and even jails are ancient, some dating initially to medieval times. Joel and Patrick knew everything about every building, especially the ancient ones. They knew which stones moved revealing unknown passages, etc. I once accompanied Joel in the middle of the night into an abandoned medieval chateau, a property of the French state. He knew a passage from outside that was totally invisible. I also went into Campere City Hall with him through an unused sewer. He broke into these kinds of places for fun, or to say he could do it because he knew the town and knew all its secrets. This seemed to be true in incident after incident. He knew things that were true in Campere families hundreds of years ago, like skeletons in the closet. He held his foster mother hostage because of things he knew about illicit land deals in the early 9th century, which would have jeopardized her holdings in the present. His foster mother tried to have him, and Patrick, incarcerated several times because she was afraid of this and other things. Many, many people in Campere were afraid of Joel and Patrick. I was afraid of them too. And I was glad Joel had for some reason chosen me as a friend, because, frankly, these two were ominous. A good rumor had it that Patrick had gouged someone's eyes out, and that Joel had killed someone. 
I say good rumor because it was repeated by so many normal-seeming people. All around Campere, there are tiny Breton towns. Joel was known by the damnest people in all of them. Extremely old sailors, cafe owners, pea farmers, and peasants, especially what we'd call peasants. Lots and lots of really old people knew and feared Joel and Patrick. All of what I wrote happened in my 20s. Joel and Patrick were, respectively, one and two years younger than me, more or less 21 to 26 years old. Both considered themselves better than anyone, aristocratic even, superior. Both knew Nazi types left over from the occupation of Brittany. They endorsed vehement ideas of racial and ethnic superiority. They called themselves evolutionary mutants and told others that, while they possessed no supernatural powers, they were evolutionarily superior in all other ways. And their looks, brains, connections, language, points of reference, and physical abilities seemed to confirm it. School dropouts should have been country bumpkins, but Joel, for example, could quote entire pages of Nietzsche and Kant, especially Nietzsche, by heart. They spoke no language but French, but their intellectual range also seemed to be boundless. Joel always claimed that he had had a mysterious life, but refused to speak about it during the time that we were best friends. But a few very old peasant types told me that Joel had been around forever. I knew him when I was a child, one said. He had a different name and lived on a farm a little ways out of town, but it was him. Other old people in Breton villages said more or less the same thing. Joel and Patrick didn't age. They just changed names from era to era and reappeared in different homes. The time we broke into Campere City Hall, Joel found a folder, I think it was an old police folder that had perfect, I mean perfect likenesses of him and his brother in mid-19th century garb, surrounded by strangers. My ancestors, Joel said in a way that I didn't believe him. The pictures were of him and Patrick, period. And he'd pulled them out of a forgotten locker in a sub-basement of an ancient building. These and many other things convinced me that Joel and Patrick were indeed superannuaries. This all happened between 1970 and 1979. Both boys have since disappeared. Relatives of mine in Campere say they are not gone but living somewhere else in Brittany, some other village, under new names. There seems to be evidence of this. How Could I Have Known? By Christy B. Nearly all of my life I have had experiences involving ESP, though it wasn't until I was about 12 that I realized that was what it is called. Now I'm 16. The earliest events I can remember were when I was about four years old. I used to be able to zone out whenever there were no distracting noises and I could hear voices. They were always conversations between people I didn't know, but they were extremely accurate predictions of what happened 24 hours later. They didn't explain exactly, but when they talked about sickness, a very close family member would get sick thereafter. When they fought right afterward, I remember having a huge fight with my best friend. That lasted until about age eight, when they began to happen less and less, and a new kind of experience took over. I began seeing events in my dreams. One of the most striking events happened when I was eight. I had a pet bunny that I had gotten for Easter the year before. Her name was Buttercup. One night in bed, I had a dream that I was in my garage, and these kids came and convinced me to let her out of her cage. I did. But as soon as it happened, she ran away and was gone. I woke up totally sobbing. My mom came in to see what was wrong, and all I could say was, Buttercup's gone, Mama. Buttercup has gone away, and we can't ever see her again. She, of course, assumed it was a nightmare and told me to go back to sleep. It's just a bad dream. Buttercup is safe in her cage downstairs. I woke up the next morning, and during breakfast, my dad walked in. He had some bad news. Apparently, when he got up that morning, Buttercup was gone. Even though her cage was still firmly latched, there was no sign of her. We never saw her again or found out where she went. How could I have known? Another time when I was 12, I woke up early one morning, and I still could nearly swear that I heard my mom telling my dad, Oh, Christy will be so happy. The Beanie Babies came into work. What a surprise. Note, this was during the Beanie Baby craze when I collected them avidly. My mom used to order them through her flower shop, and I always got first pick. So when a shipment came in, it was a big deal to me. I got out of bed and ran to her room, where, amazingly, my mom was fast asleep. I woke her up and was begging her to let me go to her shop when, completely confused, 
She asked me to explain what was going on. I told her, and she laughed and replied, Go back to bed. It's only 5 a.m. You must have been dreaming. That is totally impossible. According to her, logically, it couldn't have happened because not only was it too early for her to find out something like that, but also the Beanie Babies were only delivered on Monday through Friday. It was a Saturday. Also, the order had been placed three days before. It took three to five weeks to arrive. I believed her because it was exactly right. There is no way she could have said that and no way they could have come. That afternoon, we got home, and there was a message from a coworker on the answering machine. You guessed it, the Beanie Baby order against all odds, arrived today. How could I have known? Little Boy Lost by A. Long This haunting was witnessed by my boyfriend and me around 1987-88. My father was in the military, and we had moved quite a bit by the time I was 15 years old. We had been living at a base in New Brunswick, Canada, at the time. I had met my then-boyfriend in high school, and we had been together only a few months when one evening he asked me to come over and keep him company while he looked after his little brother. I packed up my homework and headed over. When I got there, his little brother asked to play with some neighborhood kids down the street. We let him go on the condition that he stay within yelling distance. He agreed, and off he went. We were upstairs studying and doing our English essays. I found it cold, so I asked my boyfriend if he had a sweater, and he then told me to get one out of the closet. I opened the closet door and was greeted by extremely cold air, which was odd considering it was late May. I commented on this, and my boyfriend replied that he had noticed it the other day. We then got back to work when we heard footsteps come up and stop by the bathroom door. The bathroom light then flicked on and off, on and off. My boyfriend got up to tell his little brother to quit it. He went out, got to the bathroom, and I could hear him say, This is not funny. I asked him what he was talking about and went to the door. He was searching all the rooms. He had asked if I had seen his little brother, and I said that I hadn't. He then proceeded to check the rest of the house, right down to the basement. No, little brother. He came back upstairs and asked me if I was sure I didn't see him. I told him that I hadn't, and turned to check out the window to see if I could see the kids. I looked down the street, and there was my boyfriend's little brother. I said, see, he's right down there. The footsteps started again, right up the stairs. I stopped by the bathroom, and the light flicked on and off, on and off, a small giggle, then nothing. I then proceeded to pack up my homework. I told my boyfriend that it was creeping me out and that I had to leave. He asked me to stay, but I sat out on the front porch until his parents came back. We just started out the front door when we heard small footsteps coming down the stairs. We shut the door, sat out on the front porch, and stayed there. Upon my boyfriend's parents' arrival, we told them of the incident. They just looked at us and walked into the house. Upon our insistence, his parents checked out who had lived there prior and if anything unusual had happened. It was found out that a few years ago, there was a family that had lived there and that the father had been charged with child abuse. The room my boyfriend then occupied was a little boy's bedroom. The father would beat him and lock him in the bedroom closet. The last beating left the boy in bad shape. He never made it. I have a strong feeling that the little boy has always been there, but once my boyfriend's family moved in, three boys, he was delighted and wanted to have playmates, a big brother, to play with. There were many other small incidents, but we would just chuckle and continue on with whatever we were doing, knowing that we may have been keeping a little boy happy. The Ghost's Room by Shannon J. My house is four years old and so far, I am the fourth owner. It seems every 8 to 12 months, people move out. The house is lovely and was for sale for such an amazing price that I snatched it up. The people from whom I bought it seemed almost paranoid. All through the looking to buy process, I could never go to the house without them being home. No realtor or prospective buyer could come over when they weren't home. They were very strange when I met them, but I thought nothing of it beyond. People can be strange. Anyway, after moving in, I noticed right away that my dog wouldn't go in the basement. I attributed it to his bad hip, but he went up and down the stairs to the other two floors without problems or qualms. I noticed that whenever I left the downstairs bedroom door open, it would be closed the next time I came back. Not being afraid of ghosts, I actually hoped that was what it was, so I got to saying things when I would go in the room or basement. I'm coming down, but I don't mean to bother you. 
I just need to do laundry, but it was all mostly fun. One day I was making my bed, and the two double doors to my room swung shut with a slam. No windows were open. They do not drift shut as some doors do, and they slammed with force. Also, one of the doors has a lip, so if you don't shut that one first, they won't shut. The doors shut perfectly. That was the only time in all the instances of experiences that I was nervous or afraid. The dog wasn't in the room with me. I was home alone and felt I had offended or been madly angry at the presence in my house. I asked her what I had done and apologized if I had upset her. I said that since she couldn't communicate with me, I might occasionally do things she didn't like, but it wasn't intentional. Eventually, the feeling that I had upset her faded and nothing else happened for a while. I call it a her, as that is the feeling I get, or perhaps I just like thinking it is a female entity better. Anyway, one day a piano tuner came over and had to take the hammers with him to replace them. The only way the piano could now make sound was to physically hit the strings. The piano tuner was in the kitchen with me, and I was signing the paperwork when the piano distinctly played three notes. The piano tuner said, What was that? I laughed and said, Probably just the ghost. But I seriously thought the dog was inside and his tail had hit the strings or something. The tuner went a little white and I said, No, I'm sure it was the dog. He pointed to the window, where my dog could clearly be seen sleeping in the sun. He left in a hurry and has yet to come back with my hammers, that happened in January. Every time I call him, he says he is running behind. I have recently had a friend stay with me on occasion, and she wanted to stay in the room in the basement as it was much bigger than the smaller guest room and she could watch TV late at night without concern for waking me. Soon after, she began having bad dreams and didn't want to sleep there anymore. So she was up in my room watching TV, and I was making nachos. I placed some sour cream on a plate and tapped the spoon on it, and the plate began to rotate. I was very excited, but I didn't want to jump to conclusions. The sour cream lid was near the plate. It could have been that the plate was held up a bit by the lid, and when I tapped it, it rotated off of it. I moved the lid. It was not touching the plate, but I thought that could be because it rotated off of it. I tapped the spoon on the plate again, lightly, and it rotated almost a full turn. I called my friend and said, do it again, and it rotated a bit more with no touching by me. I called my friend again, and when she started down the stairs, I said, do it again. Nothing. I tapped the plate, but nothing. I tapped it harder, but nothing. I tried to turn it myself and, of course, was able to. But the amount of resistance from the plate on the counter was such that even spinning it a bit did not rotate it almost a full turn, nor as smoothly as I had seen it rotate before. I am unsure whether my friend believed me, but later that same night she went to get her things from the basement room, and the door to the bedroom was locked from the inside. Now this is a key lock, not one of those Jimmy with a knife locks, and when I got the house, I made sure all the keys worked on their prospective doors and left them in the locks. I tried the key in the door, and it wouldn't work. I tried another key, thinking maybe I got them confused. I tried every key. No luck. My friend thought she might not have locked the window, so we went out in the dark with a candle to see if I could get it open. I tried with a flathead screwdriver to open it, but with no luck. Then I thought I would try from the top to the bottom. It was then that I noticed the bar was across the window. You know how you place one in the back of a window so it can't be opened? So, I turned to my friend and said we weren't going to have any luck because of the bar, which bounced out of where it was braced between the wall and window, falling to the floor inside. We both decided, a bit shaken up, to go inside and wait until morning. I don't mind ghosts, but I'm not going into a dark room with a possibly pissed off ghost and a little candle after watching that would just pop out of its braced position and fall to the floor. I was able to open the door this morning, and we got all her stuff out. I took the doorknob out, but I assured her that we would leave her alone, and nothing has happened since. The events of last night do not have me concerned or scared. I think she likes her room left alone, and I respect that, but I am curious what a professional thinks of this and what steps I can take to find out what she wants, to make our living experience more amiable. And to confirm she is not an angry spirit, which might harm someone, I don't think so, but I have heard spirits can be sneaky, and most of all, to have someone outside of my friends, family, and piano tuner, someone who knows about this sort of thing, confirm she is here. Past Life Nightmare by Supin 
After reading your stories about past lives, it brought back an experience I had about a year ago. I don't know what it means, but I do know it felt very real. I went to bed one night. I knew I was relaxed and had nothing on my mind, so I fell asleep quickly. I guess at some point in my sleep, I felt like I was being carried at a high speed, and then I gasped. I was running. I was afraid. I was cold, and I remember running down a narrow street. It was daylight. I was out of breath and crying. I was also holding the hands of a little girl, maybe about six or seven years old. She looked at me and said she was tired. I looked at her, and she was a little blonde child with straight hair. I remember being surprised. She said, Mommy, we need to stop. I'm tired. Even then, I was confused. I was a black woman, and somehow I knew that. So why is this white child calling me mommy? I looked in a store window. I was white with a black wig on, but I had no control over what was going on. I just knew I had to protect my child. We stopped in what seemed to be a park. I can see the water and the birds. We sat down, and I pulled her close to me. She looked at me, and I told her it would be okay. I just need to make a phone call, and someone will pick us up, and we'll be safe. Your dad will not hurt us again. As I type this, my neck hurts and I feel strange, but I'll go on. I remember making the call and a female voice telling me the van would pick us up, just say where we were. I felt I could trust this voice, so I told her. She said a black van would be there soon. It was. I remember taking my little girl and walking towards the van, very scared, and looking around. The streets looked like European streets, and it was very wet and cold. Someone came out of the van. He told us to get in the back. It would be okay. We walked to the back. The doors opened, and my husband came out. I remember gasping, Oh my God, oh no. He was white with black hair, and very mean looking. He pulled us in. My little girl was crying, Daddy, no. Don't hurt her. He had a gun. I felt so scared. I begged him, Don't. Please don't. He looked at me and said, you'll never take her from me. Everything went black. There's no more. I woke up, afraid, scared. I don't know who I was or what happened to the little girl. He must have killed me. Black Hooded Apparitions by Vicky L. I have had the old hag experience many times, but one in particular that really stands out in my mind happened to me several years ago. It took place shortly after my daughter was born. In November of 1978, we had moved into an old farmhouse that was creepy to begin with. We had a Doberman pincher that you ordinarily could not keep out of the house when you opened the door. Well, when we brought him to the house, he would not come in. I had to grab him by his collar and drag him in, with him fighting every inch of the way. Right then, I should have known the house was going to be different, along with an upstairs room with flies covering the windows just like in a famous horror movie. Visitors who spent the night would always tell us the next day, I am sorry, but your house is creepy. I felt like someone was watching me all night long. The night that I experienced this old hag syndrome, we moved our bedroom into the dining room because the stove in the other room had quit and Illinois can have some severely cold winters. I awoke sometime during the night and was able to see everything in the room. My tiny daughter in her crib at the foot of our bed and my husband sleeping contentedly beside me but I could not move. I felt a presence beside me that was communicating with me. It was strange, and I was terrified. The visitor was telling me to come with them. This was strange considering they had no faces, only black hooded robes and darkness where their faces should have been. I was telling them no, even though I could not speak aloud. I tried to move to wake my husband, but all I could do was make strange guttural sounds. They finally left and went out past the foot of our bed, but they did not disturb my daughter or my husband. I must have fallen asleep or passed out. I awoke very shortly after that, still very frightened, and the room was freezing. I woke up my husband to tell him what happened. He comforted me and went to our bedroom to get another blanket and to check on our daughter. He covered her with one and got back into bed and told me everything was all right, to go back to sleep. When we awoke later in the morning, my husband said, Honey, remember when I got up to get the blankets? Well, don't be alarmed, but our front door was standing wide open. All I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open, feeling the shock spread through my body. I know the door was closed because we checked doors together before we went to bed. Many more strange things happened there, 
but nothing like that has ever happened to me since then. We later moved, and I heard a couple of years ago that the house burned, killing the two young men who lived there. Grandfather's Goodbye and Dream by Matthew F. I had a strange experience when I was 13. At the time, my granddad was around 65 years old and in seemingly good health, working every day in his large garden and orchard. Usually, I don't remember my dreams, or if I do, it is a very vague recollection. The evening this happened, I had been awakened from a very vivid dream by the phone ringing at around 2 in the morning. I still remember the strange dream I awoke from extremely well, although it was 13 years ago. In my dream, I was in the elementary school I attended when I was younger. A bunch of my classmates were there. When we got to the library, we sat down in the brightly colored plastic chairs they had. At the front of the center island was a large bronze-looking coffin sitting on top of the movable reference island they had in the library. A person came into the library. I knew it was my grandfather somehow although he appeared to be nothing but empty, loose beige wrappings like a mummy. He came over and talked to me. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it had something to do with him being okay and to be happy for him. After that, he climbed into the coffin and was shutting the lid when the phone woke me up from the dream. I answered the phone, and it was my grandparents' next-door neighbor. He told me my granddad was very sick and to wake up my parents. The next morning before school, they told me he had died from a severe heart attack around the time the neighbor was calling us. It still gives me goosebumps when I think about it.